Amen. Good morning. We are glad you are here with us this morning. We are continuing in the book of 2 Corinthians, the messy church. Corinth just hadn't got unmessy yet. We've been through all these chapters and it's still messy. But that's okay because we're learning how to not be messy as a church, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 7 through 18. And as Jared mentioned, we will be praying for the teachers and students and everybody after, after service, at the end of service uh, today. And, and you noticed when he mentioned school, it was groans from the students and it was cheers from the parents. You notice that's, how, that's just kind of how it works, isn't it? Um, I want to thank you also for everything. All the cards, all the gifts, the ice cream, uh, making fun of all my pictures. I appreciate that. Uh, a lot of them were worthy of making, being made fun of, no doubt. We changed through the years. And sometimes you look back and you're like, really? Really? I, I look like that? And like, yeah, man. Y'all, y'all, I'll see your pictures one day, hopefully. I'll stalk your Facebook page. Right? I'll do it. I'm not afraid. Also, um, with school starting, it seems like Christmas is next week. Right? It feels that way. It never, am I right? So, you know, we need to keep praying just for school and everything and, and, and everybody involved in that. And, and just, man, our country just needs prayer. Right? So we just need to pray the Lord's hand upon our country. His grace and His mercy that truth will, will be welcomed. And uh, we just need to continue to pray that way. As we talked about last week, there, is a, there was a fierce war for our minds, right? We talked last week how there is, every day there is a war that we fight as individuals, as people. There's a war, if you're a Christian today, there is a war that you fight on a daily basis, moment by moment, and, and it is a personal attack, right? If you're a believer, the devil hates you. He has sent send his, his demons to, to get after us, to try to tempt us to do wrong, or just to not do the right thing, or whatever it may be, but it is always personal, and he uses a lot of weapons. We talked about his weapons and how he is, uh, he is one that always knows how to, to get to us, right? But then we saw that the war, that, that the Lord is the one, as we seek him, he's the one that fights the war. Because we can't fight, we're weak, and, and he is the one that's strong. And when we are weak, he shows his strength and he can do it. Paul transitions in this chapter, as we understand it, in verse 7. He starts to transition to help them understand godly leadership. Godly leadership. Now, if, if you understand leadership, everything rises and falls on leadership. Everything. Uh, I mean, just go from the, you can, corporations, governments, businesses, companies schools, right? Families, churches, individuals. What we forget a lot of times is godly leadership is not just in, a, in an organization, but who do we lead every day that needs godly leadership? And that is ourselves. So godly leadership, if you're not a leader today in whatever capacity that you are, understand that you still are because you have to lead yourself in a godly fashion. Don't forget about that. Paul goes on here and he's, he's discussing godly leadership because as we've talked about through Corinthians, there are some, as Paul was in Corinth for, for a year and a half planting the church there, and as he left, there were false teachers that came in to take his place. And the false teachers were assuming the, the leadership role of the Corinthian church. And and they've began to talk about him, and they have done all of these things to, to downplay his character. And they've been, everything in the world, they've been trying to get the, the Corinthians to forget about that guy, Paul, and to follow them. But Paul here talks about godly leadership. What does godly leadership look like? I mean, boy, wouldn't that be great that everybody understood what God or godly leadership looked like. But we can only handle it for us. If you lead anything, this is for you. If you don't lead anything and you just lead yourself, this is for you. 
Paul gets serious here, and, and he talks about this. And, and boy, we need to understand what it means to be godly leaders and what godly leaders look like, how to identify godly leaders, right? We're going to read this in chunks today. We're going to begin in verse 7, and we'll read down to verse 11. Let's begin in the Word of God here. Look at what is obvious. If anyone is confident that he belongs to Christ, let him remind himself of this. Just as he belongs to Christ, so do we. For if I boast a little too much about our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for tearing you down, I will not be put to shame. I don't want to seem as though I'm trying to terrify you with my letters. For it is said, his letters are weighty and powerful, but his physical presence is weak. And his public speaking amounts to nothing. Let such a person consider this. What we are in our letters, when we are absent, we will also be in our actions when we are present. We begin, and Paul leads to the very first important point about godly leadership. It is about spiritual authority. Spiritual authority. He's telling them here because they had besmirched his character and talking about him and all these things. And the first thing he says in, in verse 7, look at what is obvious. And what is obvious is they are a church in a pagan city. And they're there because the Lord used Paul to plant that church there. And he said, it's obvious that I've had good leadership in this church because y'all even exist. He said, it's obvious. And it wasn't a fleshly action. He didn't plant the church to make himself rich or to, to get a, a, a claim from everybody. He would plant a church and he would grow it up and then he would go on. And, and all of what he did, all of the churches that he planted were, were planted out of his spiritual authority to go from place to place to plant churches for the glory of God so that people can know without a doubt who the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is. Paul is talking here. He says, man, he said, he said, if anyone is confident that he belongs to Christ, let him remind, be reminded of this, that just as he belongs to Christ, so do we. They were even, we believe they were even saying, well, you know, was Paul even a Christian? Was he even a Christian? I mean, really, he says all this stuff. He, he writes these big, heavy letters and he's mean to you in the, in the letters. But was he even a Christian? And they're questioning that, and Paul's reminding them, let me remind you, if they think they're Christians, so are we. Paul's saying, we planted this church because the Lord had us plant this church. And he goes on, he says, we, for if I boast a little too much about our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for tearing you down, I will not be put to shame. Authority, spiritual authority. We all understand what authority is, even though we buck against it often, right? We understand that God has all of the authority. Simple as that. <clears throat> he has created everything. He is the one that is in power over all. And then it trickles down from there. We know that spiritual authority here is Paul reminds them that he had the spiritual authority, as it says, given to him by the Lord. Now that's important to know. Because there's a whole lot of people that try to take spiritual authority that it is not given to them by the Lord. They just want to take over. And that's what he's talking about, these, these false teachers in Corinth. They don't have spiritual authority to do this. They just want to take over. There is a difference between people who are called and have spiritual authority versus people who think they're called and want to have spiritual authority. The irony, if you look through the scriptures, everybody that has been given spiritual authority didn't want it, didn't reach out for it, didn't ask for it. The Lord gave it to them. He said, you're going to do this. Everybody, if you look at all the prophets, they ran the other way. They didn't want to do it. And, and if you talk to most preachers, they, they'll say the same thing. Did you want to go? In? No, I didn't want to go into ministry out. Lord put me in a headlock and he wouldn't let go. And, and it's a heavy duty thing, right? This spiritual authority that, 
that, that Paul is talking about here because spiritual authority is what we all have in a way over ourselves. You can change, as we talked about last week, you can change about the, the things that, that you're thinking in your head about yourself. You can change that because you've got spiritual authority in Christ, in, in prayer and in the Word of God. And Paul says this spiritual authority is, is something that God has given it. And, and understand, the, the greatest leader that we know that has been in existence was a Jewish carpenter. Jesus was the greatest authority, the greatest spiritual authority, the greatest leader that the world has ever known. And he talks about authority, he talks about leadership a lot in the scriptures, right? And, and we know in, in John 19, they have taken Jesus before Pilate, the Jews are wanting him to be crucified, and Pilate's questioning him, and Jesus won't say a word, and, and Pilate snaps at him, he says, you know that I've got the authority to, to set you free. Jesus looks at him and says, well, and you wouldn't have that authority unless my father gave it to you. Jesus just kind of put things in perspective. Right, as humans, we often can, can think that our head gets big and we know a lot of stuff and, and we're an authority on things. But you know, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus says that God gives the authority. And you, and you go through Scripture, and there's a lot of reference talking about spiritual authority. Specifically, we talk about in Romans 13 about the government. God has given the governments of the world authority. He puts people into place that he wants in, there in place, and he, he removes people that he wants to remove. And, and that is every government on the face of the earth. It's not just ours. Spiritual authority. Employers. We know that Ephesians 6 and 1 Peter chapter 2. That employers have a spiritual authority. Even if they don't do it in a spiritual manner, they have a spiritual authority. We are to, we are to, to follow our employees, our employers' instructions. Right? And then you see that there's also the spiritual authority of the husband. Spiritual authority as parents. And then he talks about the spiritual authority of, of pastors in the church. How God has given an authority. It, but this authority, this spiritual authority is, is specifically given. And Paul tells us exactly why. For building up and not for tearing down. That's what spiritual authority is for. Spiritual authority is not to look better, not to, to be able to boss other people around. Right, there's a difference between authority and authoritarianism. Right, authority here is to build up. But somebody who wants to be an authoritarian wants to tear them down so they look better and build themselves up. That's what an authoritarian does. The, the spiritual authority wants to serve and to, to pitch in and to do whatever is needed, wherever it's needed. The authoritarian wants to demand that other people serve them. You see that a real spiritual authority, somebody who has real authority and understands it, they say, do as I do. The authoritarian tells us, you do what I tell you to do. There's a big difference. You look at the leadership of Christ, and he was the perfect example of spiritual authority and leadership. He served, and he served, and he served. It's interesting, in, in the Gospels, in Matthew, Matthew chapter 23, he's looking at the Pharisees and all of their control and power that they had over the, the church in Jerusalem and all over, and and he's looking at them and, and he's trying to teach his disciples that that's not what leadership looks like. Right? That's not what leadership looks like. They, they dress in fancy garments. They, they tie extra weights on the people in all of their laws so that they can control them. And then he tells them this. This is the instructions that he gave them. He says, the greatest among you will be your servant who exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. 
That's what spiritual authority and spiritual leadership, godly leadership look like. You're a servant first. You serve and you serve and you serve and you take care of people. And the disciples, he walked with them for three years and they still didn't get it. At the beginning of their time together in Luke chapter 9, the disciples are kind of talking about, hey, this is the Messiah and he's going to set up his kingdom. So who of us is going to be the greatest in his kingdom? Right? And they're vying for position. They're thinking his kingdom is going to be an earthly kingdom. You know, hey, I want to be the secretary of state. I want to be the, the vice messiah. Right? I want to be the assistant. And, and, and they're talking about this. Right? And, and in their stupid heads, they think this is real. And Jesus corrects them in Luke chapter 9. And this is the passage. He says, an argument started among them about who was the greatest of them. But Jesus, knowing their inner thoughts, took a little child and had him stand next to him, and he told him, Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. For whoever is least among you, that is the one that's greatest. Jesus says, Guys, come on. We just started on this adventure, and you think you're already arguing about who's going to have places in the kingdom, you know, who's going to be the greatest. And he says, If you can welcome this child... You've got something going on. Now, understand, children, you know, children back then, they had no, everybody didn't like children. And they were the least of these in the kingdom, supposedly, in the Roman kingdom. And Jesus used the child as an example of something to be that nobody wanted to be. And then, in all of the disciples' great intelligence and learning, they discussed this again in Luke chapter 22. They had forgotten what happened in Luke 9, and now they go to Luke 22, and they're asking the same question. Who is going to be the greatest? Jesus tells us this, then a dispute rose among them about who should be considered the greatest. Second time they've done this. You, have you ever, does the Lord try to teach you something and you just don't get it the first time? Or is that just me? Y'all, y'all, most of y'all get it the first time, right? Okay, I got you. But this is the second time it's happened. They're arguing about who's going to be the greatest. After he got on to them the first time, now this may have been a couple of years before that, but they're so dense that they don't get it. I'm so thankful that the disciples, because man, can we not identify with the disciples? But he says this. He said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. Right? They've got the entourage. They've got all of the people. They've got the security. They've got their fine robes and the fancy houses and the gold chariots and all of these things. They lord it over them. And those who have authority over them have themselves called benefactors. It's not like not to be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever is greatest among you should become the youngest and whoever leads the one serving. For who is greater, the one that's at the table or the one that's serving? He said, isn't it the one at the table? He said, but I am among you as one who serves. Serves. No matter what authority you've been, giving, been given in this world, we're called to be servants. That's the first and foremost. How do you do that? How do you, how do you give the Lord, you know, your authority and, and help him to work with you? Well, you consistently walk in the Lord and you pray. If you own a company, if you're working with the company, if you're a boss over people, if, you have, if you're in a family, you have a spiritual authority. How do you keep your spiritual authority intact? How do you know that you're leading the right way? It is by consistently and, and every day walking with the Lord and praying and letting Him change you as a leader and as somebody who He has put in the place where you are. Paul wants them to understand that this is the authority that God's given him, not one that he has taken. He goes on and he says, I, I, I don't want to seem as though I'm trying to terrify you with my letters. He said his letters are weighty and powerful, but his physical presence is weak and his public speaking amounts to nothing. Understand what he's saying here. I don't want to terrify you. He says, I am not a spiritual authority in this church just to be sweet and kind. 
He said, my letters that I have sent to you have been quite severe, but you've needed it. Right? As a spiritual authority, we have to be people that tell the truth in every situation, in every instance. Even if it's not popular. Do you hear that? Spiritual authority, godly leadership is being able to tell somebody that they, there's another way to do this. The way you're doing it isn't the correct way to do this. And we've got to do it this way. That is part of spiritual authority authority. Our world thinks that people that, that say that they know how to do things and people that, that say that they know what is right and wrong, that you're ridiculous because there's a million ways to do it. But it's interesting with those same people, if, they don't, if you don't do it their way, then they're hacked off. Part of a spiritual authority, part of godly leadership is the ability to tell the truth for somebody's good. For somebody's good. If you look around and you see people in your life that are consistently making these mistakes and it's affecting their lives left and right, do you just stand back and say, oh man, that's a, you just wait for the car wreck to happen? You see, that's unloving. That's the epitome of hate almost. Why would you, if you knew that Jesus is the answer, that his word is true and that it is for our benefit, that he's, he, he takes the chains from us. We are forgiven. We are made new. And if we know that, why do we keep it to ourselves when we see people about to go off a cliff in their lives? Part of spiritual authority is being able to tell the truth and tell the truth in love. That is the command. Most people, we get so fed up that by the time we get to the point of telling the truth, we're hacked off. If we would tell the truth earlier, tell them in love and in kindness for their own good, then that's when we start to see people's lives change. Then Paul goes on in verse 11, and he, he, he gets after him and he says, Let, let's, let's consider this. What we are in our letters when we are absent we will also be in our actions when we are present. I remember when I was a kid, I was making a lot of noise in my room. My dad told me to quiet down. Okay, okay. He would just yell, right? Dad had this booming voice. You could hear it like all over the house. And, and I was making noise. I got to making noise again. And the next phrase is a phrase that I'll never forget. Son, don't make me come in there. Because I knew what would happen after that. Right? Don't make me come in there because I'm going to straighten you out. Paul here in verse 11. He's saying, don't make me come back there. Don't make me come back the way that I left. Don't do it. He's using his authority. He's not an authoritarian. He's not demanding all of these things from them. He is telling them all this for their own good. And he says, you need to stop all this shenanigans. You just need to stop it. Don't make me come. Don't make me come in there. Paul was serious. This spiritual authority that we have and godly leadership is important because if we do it, you see, you, you think that the leadership from the head down always affects and it does. It does. The leader always affects everybody else. But if the people here that are working in the corporation or the members of the church or the members of the, of the company aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, it affects everything all the way from the top down. Spiritual authority matters. Paul goes on, though. He said that's not the only factor. Verse 12, we see foolish comparison. For we don't dare classify or compare ourselves with some who are who commend themselves, but in measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves to themselves, they lack understanding. This is kind of a silly sentence here almost. It's the idea that these false teachers 
had commended themselves. When Paul left, they come in with their resume in hand. I want to lead your church and look at all these things I've done. Right? I've been here and I've done this and I'm a great speaker and I'm good at this. And, all, and here you go. And they've commended themselves to the church. And they had, they had just kind of snuck their way in and weaseled their way in to where at this time they were leading the church and they were commending themselves. They were patting themselves on the back. They were, they were tooting their own horns. Saying, I'm the best that ever was. You, that Paul, he's a louse. He's not worth anything. He's weak. When he, he's a bad speaker. I mean, the guy, he's not any good. I'm a great speaker. And understand the area that they come from. In that time, oratory was something that was practiced and celebrated. They would stand on corners and they would give speeches and, and try to awe people and gather for themselves their own, their own pupils, right? And so it was a thing to, to just practice being an orator. And, and they were probably great speakers and Paul was not so much. By their standards. But Paul saying they. We're not going to come to you. And we're not going to commend. Ourselves to you. We're not going to play that game. I don't have to make a case. I lived with you for a year and a half. You know who I am. Right. I don't need to, to brag on myself. I don't need to pat myself on the back. I don't need to, to re-give you my resume. I don't need to do that. Right, I just need, you just need to understand who I am. But you see, we live in a world of self-promotion. Right, they were self-promoting. They were commending themselves. We currently live in a world that is full of self-promotion. I mean, just look at Hollywood. Right, they make the movies and, they, and then they have get-togethers to celebrate themselves. Right? And then you look and, I mean, it seems like every other weekend there is some kind of awards. Right? You've got the Academy Awards. You've got the Screen Actors Guild. You've got all of these other awards where they all they do is gather around and have expensive food, spend a lot of money, and pat themselves on the back. It's happening in the music industry, too. You see, all of these people, I mean, now you can be famous just for being famous. You can promote yourself. Right? You can be TikTok famous. You can, you can, all these things. You can go viral on YouTube. And, and it's about promoting yourself. Paul's saying, godly leadership is not promoting yourself. It is not bragging about yourself. It is making yourself humble before the Lord. These guys that are commending themselves, that's not the way it works. And then he goes on to comparison. We're not going to compare ourselves to them and he give us gives us their standards they measure themselves by themselves and they compare themselves to themselves isn't that the greatest comparison you can do compare yourself to yourself i mean if you compare yourself to yourself you've got low standards very low standards right i mean you can make up all kinds of stuff i came in first in the Dow Cottrell Honorary Golf Tournament at Augusta National. Oh, great. How many people were in it? One. Shot a 135, but I won the whole thing. We set our own standards. If you set your own standards and you compare yourself to yourself, then you've got a problem. They're comparing themselves to themselves. What that does is elevate themselves to make them look like they are everything. But their character is nothing. You see, school is starting. And one of, the, one of the worst things that happens in schools are comparisons. Right? Remember when you were in school and, and you didn't have all the cool clothes or you didn't have this. And, and boy, you, you were not in the in crowd if you didn't have the stuff. There was always comparison. And there, unfortunately, will still be comparison. Paul says, don't compare yourselves to each other. 
If you compare yourself to another person, it's a low standard because their standards are their own standards. You don't know exactly what their standards for their behavior and their life are. If you compare yourself to them, you, you may just be degrading yourself. Paul's saying, don't compare yourself to yourself or even other people. We're not going to do it. Paul's standard was Jesus. That's our standard. If you want to compare yourself to anybody, compare yourself to Jesus. He'll shoot us straight. Some days, some days we can glimmer and look a little bit like Jesus. Some days we look more like Judas. But we need to get out. And students, y'all need to get out of the sin of comparison. Thinking that you don't have something or you look at what people have or, or who they are or where they live or what they drive or anything. Stop it. It's unhealthy for you. Because then you, you change your own focus in life to things that they want to focus on. And you will lose yourself or you won't even know who in the world you are. Whoever God made you to be. But the secret is that you don't, you don't grow out of it. There are adults today. Well, so-and-so got, got a new truck that's this and that. and You know, I got to have that now. Right? They got a new boat or they got a new house or whatever. Right? And there's always comparison, right? That's why there's advertisements on television. To make us discontent with everything that we have. To make us want something that we don't have yet. That even when we get that, it's gonna, the, the happiness is only going to last for a moment. And then it fades away. And then you got the payment still. Paul's saying, don't compare yourselves to other people. It's not worth it. It's only, it's only negative. These false apostles had set up their own standards and their own ideas of who they needed to be, and they just stayed that because it was who they were. Christ does not want you to stay the way you are. He wants you to improve each day. You've heard that saying, the Lord loves you as you are. Yes, he does. But he loves you so much, he doesn't want you to stay that way. We leave that part out. When we come to Christ, He doesn't want us to stay this way. He wants us to grow into the image and the likeness of God. Which, if you just look around, we all need help. That's why we need Jesus every day. Every day. Paul's saying, don't compare yourselves. Don't do it. Now, it's not just on an individual basis. We know that corporations do the same thing. They look at others, other companies, see what they're doing. I remember 1985. Coke changed, they changed their, their ingredients to Coke. I remember 1985 because it was, it, was, it was a crazy year. Coke changed their flavor. And you know why Coke changed their flavor? Because Pepsi had started taking some more market share of, of their business and, and they started doing taste tests and they found that people liked the, liked the sweeter taste. And so Coke changed up their entire ingredients of the Coke and it made it something else and they called it the new Coke. It didn't go very well for them. Because by 1990, they, they had to bring back the old recipe and they called the new Coke, Coke 2. And then it went so well that they ended up, within the next decade, they ended up phasing it all out. And you cannot find the new Coke or Coke 2 anywhere. It cost them a lot of money. Coca-Cola, when you go back and you, if you do, boy, it, it happens, they do this study a lot at MBA kind of exercises. But they go back and look and see what it did to Coca-Cola and it devastated them for 10 years. And it was all because they saw what Pepsi was doing and they wanted to do what Pepsi was doing. They just needed to keep doing what they were doing with what they had. And then they would work it out from there. You see, we don't have to worry about what everybody else has. The Lord has a good plan for each of us. 
And it's a great plan. It's a perfect plan. If we just stick with him and not compare ourselves to other people and what they have or what they want or all this, the Lord will do great things. But you have to ask yourself, what is your standard for your own life? How do you know if you're doing okay? Right? That's one of the problems that we have as people is we don't, how you doing? I think I'm okay. And a lot of times our standard for being okay is just that everything is kind of nice. You know what I'm saying? You, everything's okay. Well, there's not any drama in my life. There's no emergencies. I mean, a, and if that is just our standard, that there is no problems in our life, then, then we have a bad standard. How do you measure your life? You have to measure your life according to the Word of God. That's why you have to get into it all the time. You get into the Word all the time because not only do you read the Bible, the Bible reads you. And when you read the Bible, the Holy Spirit's at work in you, and you read a passage, and then it just kind of gets you to the heart. You ever been reading the Bible and it just feels like the Lord just punched you in the face? It happens. And you're just like, Lord, I didn't even see that in my own life. Because we have blind spots. We don't see how well we're doing. We really don't understand how well we're not doing. That's why we need good, godly friends around us to, to keep us accountable. That's why we need the Word of God to keep us in the right direction. It's a question you need to ask yourself today is, how are you measuring your life? And how do you know if your life is okay? Is it based upon comparing yourself to your neighbor, comparing yourself to yourself, or are you comparing yourself to the Word of God? Paul goes on, verse 13. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but according to the measure of the area of ministry that God has assigned to us, which reaches even you. For we are not overextending ourselves as if we had not reached you, since we have come to you with the gospel of Christ. We're not boasting beyond measure about other people's labors. On the contrary, we have the hope that as your faith increases, our area of ministry will also greatly enlarge so that we may preach the gospel of, to the regions beyond without boasting about what has already been done in someone else's area of ministry. So let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one commending himself who is approved, but the one the Lord commends. These false teachers were boasting about themselves, boasting about their abilities, boasting about their resume, boasting about their, the, the great way that they can speak about all of these things. And, and they were boasting, and Paul says that is not proper boasting. Then he gives us what is proper boasting. Paul's telling him here, we're not telling you something that you don't know. We're not boasting about what we've done because you've experienced it. Most of you people there in the Corinthian church used to be pagans and did all of this crazy stuff. And now that you know the Lord, look at your life. Look at that. He says, I'm not boasting about that. And he says, I'm only, I'm only, if I do boast, it is only about what the Lord has done in this ministry. I'm not boasting about them. I, I'm only talking about the things that God has given me to do. He says, we shared the gospel with you. We're not overextending ourselves. We're not trying to outdo our critics. We're not trying to, to, to make our, hey, Paul's, I'm not trying to make myself look better than these false teachers. I'm just telling you straight. I'm just telling you straight. He said, these, these guys shouldn't be boasting about themselves. They shouldn't be having this whole list of, of things of which they are proud of that they did themselves. He says, no. It's not like that. Because it all rests on verse 17. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let me ask you this today. If you've ever done anything good, guess who was responsible for it? The Lord. See, I, I take this verse very seriously because I know that if I actually preach a good sermon, it's the Lord that did it. 
He gets the credit. If I preach a bad sermon, those are the ones I get credit for. Just in you, just like you, in your, in your business, in your life, in your family, with you, however you lead and whatever the Lord calls you to do, we're to do it well. But we have to ask him to help us do it well because we often get in our own way. We can get lazy. We can, you know, well, I've been doing this forever. I can do that tomorrow. We got to keep after it and let and please the Lord. Right? And we do that in every good thing that happens, all of the great things that happen that the Lord allows us to be a part of, He gets the credit for it and we just get to see it happen. And that's the beauty of being a follower of Christ. If you let Him use you in your life, you will be a conduit that God will use to change yourself and those people around you. You'll look around, you'll be like, holy cow, that's so wonderful what God's doing in their life, in their life. And you see it happening and you had a part of it because the Lord put you in that place at that time with the abilities he gave you, with the power of the spirit inside of you to glorify him and change the world around you. We can't take credit for that. We must boast in the Lord. Psalm 34 verses 2 and 3. I will boast in the Lord. The humble will hear and be glad. Proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. Let us exalt his name forever. When we sing and praise the Lord with our voices in song before I come up to preach, that is praising and boasting on the Lord. Right? That's, that is just what we're supposed to do because he deserves it. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. This is what the Lord says. The wise person should not boast in his wisdom. The strong should not boast in his strength. The wealthy should not boast in his wealth. But the one who boasts should boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, showing faithful love and justice and righteousness over on all the earth. For I delight in these things. Man. If you're wise, praise the Lord. Whatever you have that's good in your life, praise the Lord. We should never be boasting about ourselves. That is not good leadership. It is the opposite of godly leadership. We should boast on the Lord. We should be selfless in all that we do. We should walk with Him. And it'll change everything around us. It'll change us first. Watching Discovery Channel again the other day. Had a story on puffer fish, blowfish. I kept it on the channel. Just thought, well, this, what, what about these blowfish? Well, you know, they've got the defense mechanism to when, when they're trying to defend themselves, the puffer fish will blow up like a balloon, right? So the other fish can't get them in their mouth unless they're a really big one, right? And, but in addition to that, and I didn't realize this, they've also got a toxin. This toxin that the puffer fish has will make them taste bad to other fish. But did you know that this toxin, it's a neurotoxin. And that one puffer fish has enough neurotoxin to kill several humans. They said it'll take one to two grams of the, of the toxin in a puffer fish to actually kill a human. And they contain far more than one or two grams per fish. Right? And so you look at that and I got to thinking... You see, like a puffer fish, we can blow ourselves up with pride, right? But when we blow ourselves up with pride, we don't taste very good. And we can be very toxic to those people around us. Do you boast on yourself? Are you a good, godly leader? Are you someone who has spiritual authority and yet does not walk in that spiritual authority that God's given you? Because it's from the Lord in your family, in yourself, and however you serve, whatever it is, God has put you there for a reason to glorify Him. The truth of the matter is, is that we all let the Lord down. We need Him every day. It begins with, though, understanding what the true gospel is. Knowing that we are sinners, we were born that way. When we are born, 
We are apart from God, and only in Christ can we be saved, forgiven, and redeemed in Christ. We can't do it ourselves. The Lord is not going to, when you breathe your last breath and you have to take an account for your life, the Lord is not going to ask you what all you did for the Lord. He already knows. He's not going to ask how much you gave to the church. He's not going to ask what pew you sit in. He's not. The only question that we get at the end of our life before the Lord is, do you know Jesus? That's the question. Amen. She knows. So that's the question I'll leave with you today. Your first recognition of knowing Jesus' spiritual authority is, I am a sinner and I need Christ to save me. Jesus, perfect in all of his ways, the perfect leader, the perfect everything. He went to the cross and died for our sins. All of our sins were laid upon him on the cross and he paid for them. He took the wrath of God, scripture tells us, so that we would have the opportunity to know him as our savior and to be forgiven from all of our sins. But we have to, we have to receive that gift. Just because it happened does not mean that everybody in the world is saved. That's a myth that's going around. Everybody's saved. No, those who put their faith in Christ are saved. Well, isn't that narrow-minded? I didn't say it. Jesus said it because he is the way and the truth and the life. Those who put their faith in him repent of their sins, will be saved. I invite you today, if you don't know the Lord today, if you've not put your faith in Him and you've not surrendered your life to Him and said, God, I am an idiot. Forgive me for my sin. You, Jesus, you are the true, you are the true Savior. And I give my life to you. Then if you've not done that in your life today, I invite you during this invitation to come. Come and, and experience the forgiveness and the love of Christ that was poured out by his blood on the cross. Maybe you're here today and you've never thought about spiritual authority. You've never thought about boasting about yourself. You've never thought about comparison, comparing yourselves to other, thinking that you're less of something because somebody is more of something. And what do you do when you do that? You need to ask the Lord for forgiveness because he created you unique. There's not another one like you in this world. If you try to compare yourself to somebody else, you're diminishing what God has created in you. And the irony of it, there's probably somebody comparing themselves to you that you don't know about. Today, during this invitation, if you already know Christ, I invite you to have a time of prayer just to ask the Lord to forgive you for, for comparing yourselves to others in a negative way. Or even comparing yourselves to others to make yourself feel better. You compare yourselves to somebody with lower standards and, oh boy, I'm glad I'm not like them. We need to ask the forgiveness for that too.